exciting. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our session. Today, we will talk about where is the business in data spaces. And uh, I have three guests with me for you today, Christoph, Andre, and Richard. And the great thing about them is that none of them has a primary education in economics. What that means for us is we get a very, very real view from non-business people, from non-economists um, by their uh, academic background on why it is important to talk business when it comes to data spaces. So I love this twist to talk with data scientists um, about the business of data spaces. My name is Esther Huyam. I'll um, moderate our session today. We have 50 minutes and I'm leading the support center for data sharing for the European Commission. So um, I have some experience in data sharing and some thoughts on, on the business around it. And I would like to start before introducing our guests um, with thinking about why is it interesting and maybe even needed to talk about economics and the business of data sharing. Personally, I come from the open data movement where maybe some of you agree it was quite OK for us 10, five years ago to just me measure our success in making this data available because of the good thing of making open data pack publicly available. But then we started thinking, is it already a success when this data is available? And it definitely is. But how can we go on measure the real impact that we are creating with making data available? So we shared um, our, our concerns about it and created some new KPI logic that included a business angle quantifying the impact of data. So we started thinking about how can we create impact? How can we measure impact? So what is the business of open data? I spent quite some time with these thoughts. Um, and I'm really curious to hear from our guests today their view um, on that, because we sometimes need to advocate data sharing in numbers, because many of the stakeholders, for example, in the public sector, are just more easily convinced when we use some some numbers with some uh, with some euro or dollar signs behind that. For-profit organizations obviously need to think in profits, but also non-profit organizations need to think about how to cover the costs for data sharing. For example, to improve the data quality or to make sure that interoperability is given, for example, semantic interoperability. One example um, is a small or medium priced um, me small or medium sized supplier in the automotive industry. And for them, it might not uh, be financially feasible to change their whole semantic modeling and their metadata logic um, to onboard to a data platform. And there we need to find solutions. So thinking about the business angle of data sharing might be uh, a factor to enable data sharing and convince um, players to share their data. So far, my thoughts, um, but Richard, I'd like to hear more from you. I, I've seen that you studied data science, math, languages, political science, public policy, international economics. You have 20 years of experience as a software uh, developer and you are a scuba diver instructor. <laughs> I mean, that is exactly the mixture one needs to help us understand what is the economics of data. Can you help us? Yeah, I mean, there's so much big data in scuba diving, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> no, I, I actually um, here finished my academic career with a degree in economics from John Hopkins University. So I am an economist now by by training also. Um, here, but thank you, uh, Esther, for, for inviting me. And thank you, all of the public, for being here today. Thanks to Christoph and Andrea for... Um, being here with me. I'm the director of the European Government Consulting Unit for IDC. IDC is a large multinational research market research company. And so, um, as you might have guessed, our particular focus in the uh, Government Consulting Unit is on um, big data, AI, and, um, and the data market in, in general. Of course, because we um, work for companies 
um, and provide market research, we are interested mostly in the, um, the impact of the data economy on industry itself. Um, we, uh, we work for the European Commission and um, we are uh, managing um, the, the data market observatory. So if you look on the European Europa um, portal and you look for the data market, you'll find the data market observatory. And that's actually um, a, a work that we're coordinating. Um, that's an important piece uh, of um, uh, of work just because if you look at the uh, the data act and the uh, data governance act in particular in the data act you will see that that data market observatory is referenced in the preamble as the reason for doing the um uh, the the data act for providing the data Mar act regulation so that's really important um we are also quite involved in the data spaces um questions so we are coordinating the um the green deal the microprocessor uh, data spaces and we are uh, also involved in the uh, tourism manufacturing um, uh, data spaces uh, as well as partners um, uh, what I'd like to talk about today Richard, is... I'm, I'm very sorry for interrupting you. Um, someone in chat makes us aware that there's some background noise. Personally, I don't hear anything and I can understand you perfectly well, Richard. Maybe Christoph Andreas, I see you. Oh yeah, thank you. The, the audio is fine. All right, okay. then um, David Alexander, I hope you find a solution for your audio problem. Um, <laughs> no background no. noise, okay. It's Great. funny because they're they're substituting all of the windows in my house, and there has been so much noise over the last three or four days. It's strangely silent right now, so I was <laughs> I was surprised to hear that. But Perfect, um, thanks. what I'd like to talk about a little bit today is um, hey, first of all, what do we mean by monetization? Um, hey, and and if we're going to talk about business value, we've got to talk about people monetizing hey, data. And there's a bit of confusion. I wouldn't call it confusion, but there's different viewpoints uh, on this. So people talk about value from hey, exchanging data or using data. In, in we um, when we talk about data monetization, we're essentially talking about the return, the economic return. Um, uh, from um, from monetizing data, and we're not talking about the. And this is an external process. This is like external to your organization. We're not talking about the internal value of using data, which, um, uh, of course, people tend to uh, want to use data to improve. Um, their their business decisions. They want to use data to optimize uh, operations and find cost points and and optimize the 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 customer relationship that they have with their customers. But we're talking about him um, using and gaining some value from data outside of your company. So that can be directly selling um, data and directly generating revenues. So I collect data and I sell it. Right. Um, and examples of that are like credit card companies, credit bureaus and things like that. Or it can be creating additional revenue from selling data. So um, I have some component or some software or something that I'm selling and I, I, I bundle on data on top of that. And, um, and examples are, for example, I sell logistics software or something and I bundle on top live um, product movement or mapping data or something like that as an additional service. So you can buy my logistics service for 100, but then I'll send you the, the maps and things like that for 150. Other stuff, of, of course, that's uh, that's one of the most um, quickly growing uh, market segments because you've got all the IoT equipment that's uh, bundling data on it. You've got all the uh, mm, enterprise resource software like HR software that's bundling on demographics and, and workforce uh, movement and things like that onto the top of it. The other thing, uh, the, the third way that we see people using uh, and um, uh, um, pushing the monetization of data is through the exchange of data for something valuable, which might not be money. Um, uh, and um, uh, a really cool example of that is Transport for London. 
um, hey, what they're doing is they are uh, giving data about passenger usage um, hey, to Uber, and Uber in uh, in exchange will give free rides or discounted rides to people that in the areas that they want them to. So Transport for London is is obliged to provide route um, hey, capability to all of. Uh, of the people in 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 London, but some of the areas are are like dead trees. You know, they 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 only have two passengers a, an hour, and but to provide buses or trains or something to those areas is a real pain for them. So uh, what they found is if they uh, give uh, the the data on demographics to Uber, which uses it uh, to improve their uh, their um, positioning of vehicles, um, uh, Uber will. Uh, take the people uh, to the, the the route areas. So that's an interesting example of that. Um, uh, what I just also wanted to point out is how companies are actually monetizing data. So we found from a recent survey that um, over 45% of companies in Europe um, who, um, who have a digitalization strategy say that um, monetizing data is their... Um, is their main focus, and um, um, that seventy-five percent of those companies are actually using um, data monetization in the second one. So they're trying to generate additional revenues of that. And of those people, it's interesting to to know that they're saying that over twenty percent of their revenues are actually generated from data itself. That's really, um, you know, that's ch that's showing that things are changing. And uh, I'll give you a quick example of this that that slipped out in a, in a, um, um, in a company meeting was from Apple. It, it, it's like, do you know what Apple does? Uh, Apple, uh, of course, what does any company do? You can say a company is, is characterized by what they sell, right? So what does Apple do? They sell telephones and, and laptops, right? Um, in, a, in a recent company meeting, uh, they, uh, they uh, pointed out that the sale of data has uh, eclipsed all of the other products and services from Apple, and um, and in an in a ensuing and they don't publish this data. In an ensuing um, meeting, they said that the sale of data actually was more valuable than all of the other products combined. So Apple is a data company; they are not a telephone company any longer. Um, so that's just kind of uh, in interesting. Um, I, I have a bunch of other data, but I know that time is. Um, is pressing. So I'll just come to the question of where is the business? And, and I'll conclude with that. Um, the, um, we are really interested in following the, um, the DGA basically because of the definition of the data intermediary services and the, and the regulamentation of that, because there's all kinds of new, um, uh, new jobs, <laughs> new business that's coming out of that. So for example, um, uh, when a, whole, a data holder and a data subject exchange data, a whole bunch of stuff has to happen in, in the middle and it's creating transactional data services that are, are just blooming right now and, and really taking over. So your data has to be sec secure. So some intermediary, intermediaries, I can say that word, some intermediaries are providing security services. There's um, data, dirty, dirty data. So some companies are uh, providing transactional services to clean that data. There's a problem with the, the fact that I don't know what my data is actually worth. So there are companies that will actually go and set up pricing um, for you. On every transaction, they will tell you what the um, fair or uh, optimal pricing uh, might be for that. There's contracting issues. What are the, uh, the governance issues? How can I build that into the data exchange? There's companies that will um, provide a governance structure and um, there uh, are auditing um, uh, functions, which is really important. I mean, how do you actually measure what data was taken or used or, or whatever? Um, uh, and also in companies like mine that are data companies, we find we have a big corporate responsibility 
um, I I issue when we exchange data and when we use data. So there are companies that will actually go out and give you corporate responsibility as a service. All of these new business models are, are for myself, kind of fascinating. And I know that I might be kind of a data geek or something like that, but I, I'd love to, um, you know, go into more detail when we'll have more time or anyone can, you know, reach out to me. Um, and I'd love to talk a little bit more about that. So we, we see that there is an incredible flowering of new business models. And um, so where's the business? It's right there in the Data Governance Act. And it's also um, going to be further, uh, the envelope is going to be pushed with the Data Act when we find, finally see the end text of that. So I, I, I know that I would probably speak for another three hours on the topic, but I'll let some of the other guys come into it. Actually, that thread of yours that you can speak for hours about the topic, yesterday had some power, but after listening again to you today, I feel like, no, I could listen to that for hours. It's, it is fascinating. Thank you so much for mapping the, the business and the economic scene of sharing data, the different players along the value chain. Um, well, definitely more, uh, more than I had on my radar. And also on helping us understand how is value created with data. Um, and which companies that we uh, would not maybe have expected actually have their main business in data monetization. You said 45% of the companies um, do that. And even some that, some that we didn't think of. Um, Christoph, you are um, involved with the IDSA, the International Data Spaces Association. So you know everything about data spaces. Data spaces is one kind of data sharing. Maybe you can let us know what is what is special about it. Um, and I also see, and, and everyone who goes on your LinkedIn sees that you speak to a lot of people internationally um, and you have a lot of nice pictures. And everyone looks so happy on these pictures because you help the markets to adopt data spaces. You help them to, to share data. So I was wondering if, if all the issues that Richard mentioned, if you, if you see them as well, um, are the business issues the most important concerns that you tackle um, in the markets? Uh, how does that look like? Thank you, Esther, for this introduction. Uh, and also thanks to my data for uh, inviting me to, to this panel here. And Richard, uh, so, so let me uh, take off basically where you, where you ended your, your speech. So, uh, and first of all, let's say the, the key to understand what data spaces are. Uh, in this case, Esther, you gave me a bit too much credits, actually. So I, I would not ever claim that I know everything about data spaces. Uh, and this I is actually, you would say that. <laughs> I, I think uh, that's actually also the key um, for uh, yeah, finding your way into this topic. Um, so everything that you, you explained, Richard, is, is exactly how, how I also see it. So there's tons of uh, potential business uh, models in the area of, of data. Uh, data economy uh, in a few years from now will not be uh, anything like we experience it right now with uh, platform economy, marketplaces, uh, cloud systems, where you always have to dump your data. And this is also where data spaces um, are a solution to, to be a, yeah, a change uh, key to uh, making data economy the, the next big thing. Because one aspect in, in the, uh, especially the scenario where, where two companies, two people, two parties exchange data, one gives the data, the other one receives it. Uh, here we have an issue, which is data ownership from a legal perspective is not even a thing. Yeah? It doesn't exist. And uh, but at the same time, a company that knows about the value of their data, theoretically being will to, to make money uh, with it, they have the challenge that they're not able to keep control over, over these data sets real control. So legally, this might be a different story. Technically, this is much more difficult, especially when when you do not want to rely on the one platform uh, in which you want to host your data, where you for sure can define certain policies and rules, but you would uh, be bound to this one solution here. The, the actual data economy, how we imagine it, um, is it's much bigger. Yeah? So every company, every person should be enabled to theoretically be able to share or consume data while at the same time staying sovereign over the data. This is exactly what data spaces in general stand for and IDSA in, in specific um, for, um, for most with the concept of the um, data space connector. 
Um, but this is, of course, uh, ha uh, hard to understand. It's a huge topic. And also with what you explained, Richard, like it's not enough to talk only about the two parties exchanging data. And it's not enough to talk only about connectors. At the same time, there is tons of infrastructure that is required to make this happen. You, know, you need infrastructure to make data endpoints discoverable. You need uh, infrastructure to make uh, services discoverable. All of these uh, things, you need big digital identities, uh, certification uh, for components that are used to exchange and host data is required to raise the trust level, especially for those data assets that, that require for a Fort Knox solution, yeah, like open data where you, you started ESTA um, is a thing where you might say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm open to share the data. Uh, and if it's used by third and fourth parties, that's fine. I'm, I'm good with it. But there's also a lot of data around that companies might want to monetize theoretically, but they're not willing to give it away as open data. So you need these mechanisms that secure data that make you sovereign. Um, and this is hard to understand. So um, entry point into this world is, uh, or the key to enter this world is to commit, we don't know anything about data spaces, uh, because what happens if you don't is that there is a lot of confusion, many different solutions, architecture ideas, um, yeah, approaches for personal data, approaches for organizational data. And this is really difficult. Yeah. And at the moment where you say, okay, let's openly talk, let's sit at a table, let's let's see what, from a customer perspective, from a participant's perspective, uh, functionally is required, then all of a sudden, people start to, to agree with each other. And from this agreement onwards, you still can go the rabbit hole down to, okay, for searching data, it might be the IDS metadata broker defined by IDSA and some of the already existing implementations by their members. In other cases, it might be um, something that in the Gaia context uh, was implemented or even something else. Yeah? Um, and this is really key to success here. What I observe in recent times, um, and this is maybe my, my approach to contributing to the where is the, the money in this field and how is it uh, evolving towards the market uh, and enabling the next uh, level of data economy, um, even though we had our roots in, in research projects like uh, six, seven years ago, what I observe in recent times is projects that in some cases are still funded by ministries, by the commission, but that um, the, the initial starting point for this was a bit different. So looking at Catena, for instance, it was primarily the industry, BMW, Daimler, Volkswagen, sitting at the table making the math of, okay, guys, what do we need? Where are our business challenges? And then seeing how to fund it. Whereas uh, usual research projects start with uh, a call out there from a ministry, from a, a commission that asks for a certain solution for, for a challenge that was described earlier. And this is something where I, I'm really uh, happy as head of adoption to, to get the notion of it's really the industry demanding these sort of solutions, because also then if you look at the state of maturity of existing components, yeah, also here openly, is it ready for the market right now? Can you just go to an online shop and buy the solution for a connector or any other infrastructure? Probably not right now. Yeah, There are some, some companies who would say, uh, call them, give them a call, they will provide you a connector. But then the big ecosystem and the big market is, is not at a state where I would say it's how, how the world works. But we are in this very transition phase, which makes it so exciting to see research still helps to, to mature certain infrastructure components and bring people to the table, allowing them to have a look at all the different aspects of data spaces with time, money and people uh, will and able to understand and uh, talk about this, where it, as the same, at the same time, real industry money is joining um, the table to make these uh, infrastructure things happen. So we are really on our way uh, that data space is hopefully in some years from now, we, we should not talk about it any longer. It's something that you just use, you know, it, it should be a sort of infrastructure that me as a, as a patient, me as a citizen, uh, me as a representative of a company, it should be just natural to have a data set, define the policies, and then don't have to care about uh, how it is processed in the background. I don't need to know more about the connector or the infrastructure. I just want to make my business, right? And this is something where I'm very positive that this will happen in the upcoming years. 
uh, and also the indicators are uh, very, very positive. This is not a German thing. This is not a European thing. This is really an international thing. And this is also why the people in the pictures look so happy, um, because it's, it's really a global movement here uh, that we are looking at. And next week I will be in, in Tokyo, Japan uh, to, to meet our community there. Uh, with ministries, with people from government and with uh, company associations like our members Fujitsu, Hitachi and so on and so forth. They are really sitting at the table co-defining their standards and they really well observe what we here in Europe are doing. Um, and they're not uh, the ones who say, hey guys, you do your thing. We don't care. We take a, uh, care about our own business. They want to be interoperable. And again, here the punchline would be things are moving. The connector uh, that IDSA provides is, is a very important puzzle piece in this entire very complex game. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to admit that no one of us knows anything about data spaces to uh, foster the discussion. Thank you so thank you so much, Christoph. And um, it's I think it's so exciting to, to see uh, that after having many conceptual ideas about defining and blueprinting and frameworking a data space, um, after all these efforts, you confidently sit and say, we don't know much about it, but it is happening. And in a few years, we will not even need to think that much about it anymore <laughs> because it's a new way of working. It's a new way of doing things. Absolutely. And then yeah. I can, I can imagine, uh, Andre, you, you will hope to reach that in a few years as well in the tourism data space in, uh, in Switzerland to come. Uh, before uh, we listen to you, I would like to also thank uh, Paul and the audience in, in the chat in our Q&A session, I see questions coming in, first uh, questions being answered. So um, for those of you in the audience who have not seen that yet in the Q&A session, you can put your questions in. Um, you can also rate questions only up, not down. You can rate them up um, if you are also interested in the answer to that question, because um, in a few minutes we will look at those questions that you find most relevant. Uh, and have our uh, speakers trying to answer them, so make them tricky. I have a few myself, um, and then uh, we can look at those so they will not go unanswered. Um, so you have a bit more time to think about your questions, but mostly listen to Andre. Um, Andre, you're the president of Swiss Data Alliance and also a lecturer at the Institute of Tourism and Mobility in Luzern, and you are working on setting up a data space for tourism in Switzerland. So is it the business uh, of, of the data space that was your driver? Was it, well, I guess it was not EU funding. So um, what's the objective? What are the, what are the barriers? Can you tell us more? Yes, thanks a lot, Esther, for having me in for this uh, question. I try to make my um, uh, explanations a bit shorter that we have time for the questions. As I said, I'm, I'm the president of Swiss Data Alliance, a small think tank for data policy in Switzerland, and um, maybe can say some words about the status of data policy in Switzerland afterwards. But here I would like to um, explain um, uh, short sentences about the status and the aim of the tourism data space or the national data infrastructure for tourism we try to establish. And the funding is not coming from the EU, as you said, because we are, as Switzerland, not part of the EU, you know about that. But from from the um, uh, from the government uh, in Switzerland, I have to say, and without this funding it wouldn't be possible to start this kind of projects for data spaces and data infrastructures, full stop. I think they not coming out of the market uh, by, you know, uh, coincidence, uh, it, it doesn't happen. It, it needs an, an uh, intervention of the, of the government. That's my opinion. Now, in tourism, um, well, um, maybe it's lucrative, but uh, in the last uh, two or three years, it was difficult and uh, tourism industry, uh, like in other countries, of course, has been hit heavily by the pandemic. And uh, so the overall question is how to make um, tourism also in Switzerland uh, more resilient. And we have two uh, challenges uh, we have to address uh, where um, I think uh, the data, data spaces and data infrastructures can help. By the way, I'm not a tourism uh, specialist. I'm not coming from the tourism industry. I'm a data scientist and I try to help 
uh, the tourism sector in Switzerland uh, in using data and uh, building up data, data infrastructures and data cooperations. So the two challenges are how to make um, attractions, uh, point of interest, uh, tourism services, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, visible and accessible in a digitalized world where global platforms dominate also in tourism, uh, the, the place. Uh, as you certainly know, if you start your, your journey as a tourist of so inspiration, you start normally by Google or TripAdvisor and then you switch to booking to, to get your services and so on and so forth. Um, and for the tourism industry, this is a big challenge because also in Switzerland, the tourism industry is very fragmented on a local and regional level. And we have single tourism service providers like hotels, restaurants, museums, cable cars, whatever you want. And everybody is trying to build up their own websites and apps and, and services uh, within silos. So um, in the last few years, um, it became obvious <laughs> to the players in the tourism industry, also in Switzerland, that um, they don't come along to compete with these um, global platforms and that they have provide their data and their content uh, more openly and shared. And that's exactly what, what happens. And uh, we, we start to build up local, regional um, data and content platforms provide the tourism data and content for for third parties, also for the global platforms, but also for others. And uh, this is the beginning of, of, of um, I would say, data, data ecosystem and uh, data space, one hand. The other challenge uh, is to better understand what uh, tourism are doing. Um, because, you know, <laughs> we know, Maybe a hotel knows that uh, there's a gas coming in and stays for several days and then is leaving, but he doesn't normally know where it comes from or it's going to, and et cetera, et cetera. So um, the industry starts to measure what tourism are doing and to better understand the journey of the tourism in the country. And there we don't have only have uh, the business, a business challenge, but also a social challenge because before the pandemic, for instance, in Lucerne, where I'm working for the Institute, we had a lot of tourists coming in from abroad, from Asia, from China, and they're coming all the same time, uh, let's say uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. And then we have uh, this phenomenon that is uh, right known as over-tourism, not only Venice, we have also it is in Lucerne. So we need the data also and the uh, to about tourism behavior to better guide and influence the behavior uh, of the tourism and to have a, a more uh, sustainable tourism sector uh, in, let's say, in, in, in Lucerne and other places in Switzerland. So these are the two challenges and we try to address by the shared data infrastructure. I stop here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andre. So we now talked about what's the business uh, in, in data sharing and in data. What is what are data spaces and what are what are the challenges here and what is happening um, in terms of adoption in the market? And now we got a, a kind of a snapshot on what is happening in the tourism data space as we speak. And uh, we have more and more questions now coming in. Um, and I would like, in light of time, to uh, to move on to these questions uh, immediately. One um, from from Christian Kunz, thank you very much. Or oh, actually, two questions from you that we can maybe even put together. The first one, um, you you can all read it for yourself. Is are we envisioning a fragmented ecosystem of transactional uh, data services, or will there be packages from players? And I find this question so interesting because. It's not trivial when we think about the sovereignty and uh, the data space concept clearly says that actually it's supposed to be fragmented without one centralized power, one powerful intermediary or player in the middle. And uh, so how do we feel about a fragmented landscape with competition, with sovereignty, because we have the choice. 
to whom to go? Or do we feel about convenience, having one who just gives us a solution and how you say it, Christian, conveniently packaged? Richard, Christoph, what do you think? If I may, uh, Richard, uh, maybe, maybe one or two sentences on that. So I, I really think the convenient part. So if I think about how our people in, in our times used to make business in a digital world is like I go to a web service, I create my account and I do whatever I'm willed to do. So this is how our currently works a lot of times. Um, and this is something when you, when you put it into this uh, comparison to a federated ecosystem, I think, especially in the first days of these federated ecosystems, which are for me the, the go-to sweet spot, um, yeah, um, still the traditional solutions, if you want to call it like that, are still very important, especially for this transitioning time that we are uh, facing right now. So it is data spaces are not about throwing everything we have away, making it inconvenient and difficult to, to be part of a data space and make a business. Uh, I think the opposite is the case. And also, if, if we estimate how market adoption for data spaces in general will work, it will be the, the big players that offer current solutions for cloud um, solutions, for platforms that will enable their systems to be part of a data space and, and function as a sort of, uh, let's say, if I can say the word, uh, intermediary um, for those who, who own the data and want to share that data. Yeah? So it's, it's like the transition. First, we go for the current solutions that we have. We enable those solutions to be part of data spaces with all the data sovereignty aspects that come with the defining policies and being the gateway for everyone behind this using these solutions. Uh, and then over years and years, I think it will be more and more convenient to also uh, the point where we have um, connectors on our smartphones and be the, the masters over our data ourselves. Uh, this is, I think, how it will go. And in the, in the background, of course, it will change to a more federated system where then you don't have to worry about, I selected this one platform as my current solution uh, and I'm not interoperable with all the others around. Uh, no, because the platforms care about being part of the federated um, um, part of the story you all of a sudden also will be enabled to, to exchange your data or consume data from other platforms. I think this is where it's going. Thanks, Christoph. Richard, you unmuted. Um, yeah, it. so I think um, Christoph is exactly right. The, the, the word is federated. So before you said the, the, there's some, some fragmentation and fragmentation is kind of a negative concept and uh, I don't think it's the right word. Instead of uh, fragmented, we should probably say open and extensible. And that's where the federated concept that Christoph is, is mentioning comes in. Because we cannot control what uh, companies will do and provide. And unicorns will jump out and that will be the new model. And if we have somehow or another over-regulated it um, um, and disallowed this fragmentation, then we are going to disallow being in, in contact with reality, right? So we need uh, an open and federated extensible approach like, like Christophe is saying. Why do we need that? Because that's the only way we can ensure that, that legislation will promote growth in the sector. Um, and it's exactly things like the Data Governance Act and the upcoming uh, or um, almost their Data Act, which will give us this kind of regulation on top of it to ensure that we're, we're doing the right things in terms of, you know, privacy, security, uh, responsibility, etc. And there's, Richard, a, a question um, very related to that from Mikhail. Um, the, the roles you and we mentioned along the value chain of data sharing, um, and, and services to be purchased from them. Um, and the question here is um, that the data intermediaries, as they're mentioned in the Data Governance Act, go beyond that. And the question is, do you believe that we need to regulate those roles? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, I, I saw another um, uh, another uh, question in there. I'm not sure if you're going to come to that later, which uh, in the text was talking about the um, uh, the EHDS and um, um, uh, it's exactly because of the fact that there are people, there are humans, there's uh, sensitive data uh, going through there that it needs to be um, um, reg regulated. But at the same time, we need to make sure that things like um, patient data respecting uh, privacy concerns, uh, etc., can be used for uh, for research. So uh, society needs to find cures for a lot of uh, diseases and things like that. And that data that's sitting there, that's right now, it's really tough to to get there because of things like uh, uh, consent and uh, and these types of issues. Um, him needs to be made available, and it, we need this regulation to to go and show. So uh, exactly like it, the the question is is asking about personal data without consent of uh, of citizens. If regulation is is properly uh, formatted, we can ensure that we have secondary use of uh, of data properly governed in the governance framework, in the regulation, to ensure that um, the security, privacy, et cetera, concerns are, ma are maintained. So yes, I, I, think, <laughs> I think it's it's definitely needed. Yeah, and, and you also included uh, uh, the beginning of an answer to, to Isabel de Zegas' question. So uh, very well, thank you. And um, th there was one question that I, uh, that I uh, find also interesting because it's so provocative. Does someone dare to estimate the total EU market size for data spaces five years from now? Um, and before I, I ask the, um, our guests, um, I can already say this is in the making. So currently, as we speak, the uh, Support Center for Data Spaces is working on a methodology on how to measure the impact and the market size of data spaces five years from now. So having a kind of a um, picture of how it is right now to then understand how can we build the KPIs around it. And then um, on a, a most likely yearly uh, basis to check on the impact and also have some means to project uh, the future impact. So this is happening, um, but it is also a question. Uh, it, oh, the answer from my side is also no. So not yet. <laughs> That's my answer. But maybe uh, Christoph, Richard, do, do you dare? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I I disagree. Sorry. I mean, we are already providing models for that. We there, you saw in the chat. There's this data landscape, which is actually the data monitoring um, process of the European Commission. We have won a tender for the last three uh, cycles of the data market monitoring. We are already predicting um, market spaces. I'm sorry, market growth. You can go and look at that uh, a little bit um, on your on your leisure. But yeah, there are good models. We have been um, pretty accurate, and we've been doing this since the um, for the last ten years uh, on the growth of this market size. So you can look at our old reports. We started uh, we started our first ones in in. Um, uh, the first official reports we gave were for 2015, so we already pretty much identified uh, the, um, the 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 trick is by just giving a high and a low <laughs> um, 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 market size prediction. So it's between uh, zero and a billion, you know, and you get it. But um, so there are there are me mechanisms, and there are uh, also impact criteria and KPIs for the growth of the uh, data market. In, yeah, and the data. So we can work with scenarios, right, and then deduct um, kind of actions and strategies on what do we need to do uh, to go for the best case strategy. What is the scenario if if we don't do anything right now? Um, um, one question that comes up to me, is the data economy the same as the data spaces economy? I'd say no, um, but um, 
we cannot find the answer to that in uh, in today's session. Uh, there are a few more questions and um, that we didn't have the chance to answer so um, to the guests um, and also to our to our Q&A moderator Paul feel free um, to after the session get in contact and keep on discussing those questions. Now I would like to in invite all three speakers um, to share with us their um, final plaidoyer et tour de table, uh, what we take away from, from the session or maybe what you take away. Andre, let us begin with you. Yeah, thank you. I would coming uh, like to come back on, on the question One of minute, evaluation. Andre. Pardon? <laughs> One minute. <laughs> One minute. Uh, I would um, recommend to um, bring the problem of, of collaboration and cooperation around data as a commons in the middle of, of the discussion. Because data space is a quite an abstract uh, concept uh, that makes sense. But the problem we face uh, in the tourism industry, but I think also in other sectors, is how to bring the different players, enterprises, organizations, institutions together and to understand data's commons and to share it and to establish it as a basis for an ecosystem where business cases, database cases, become possible. That's the, 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 the most important challenge. And I don't think that regulation there really helps. Full stop. <laughs> Thank you so much. A strong statement. Christoph. Yeah, so if so what I'm what I'm usually doing, uh, being in contact with many people is uh, trying to identify are they players that that will bring the topic forward? Uh, or are they the future consumers of solutions where I in my, my talk was uh, saying, okay, there are first solutions. We also, in case you are interested in consuming services in the field of data spaces, uh, we can bring you in contact here with, with some service providers already. There are things like the mobility data space, Catena X, Smart Connected Suppliers Network in, in the Netherlands, uh, and so on and so forth. So you can really experience the real thing. But what I'm always trying to do um, still is like uh, trying to identify the the pioneers, the innovators that are not only, uh, that's too negative, sitting on the couch wanting to consume the, the benefits of, of these solutions, but rather sit with us at the table co-creating the required standards and architecture and solutions on top. So this is uh, maybe the, the shout out here for those who are interested in uh, being part of this uh, innovation process that still is happening to make the data economy of the future a data spaces economy, which uh, would be my contradiction to, to what you said, Esther. I, I really be believe that this is, um, the data spaces have the potential to be uh, the, the, the highway, so to say, the infrastructure that, that is required to make data economy flourish uh, in ways that we cannot imagine. And I'm uh, looking forward to the numbers that, that will be in the report that you just mentioned. Definitely. Thank you, Christoph. Richard, to you. Thanks. So uh, I, I think that, you know, you've obviously understood that, that I have quite a bit of enthusiasm, which goes beyond the, the normal. Um, uh, but I think this is an incredible moment. Uh, AI and big data are really changing. And I know this sounds like uh, something you've heard in every conference, but they're really changing the paradigms out there. Things are, are going to change. You'll see new kinds of services and new use of data that you never imagined in the next couple of years. We'll definitely have over a 10% compound annual growth rate in the income of that companies are making on uh, on data so um, new 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 paradigms are going to come up and and there'll be a lot of really interesting stuff but we uh, we have to ensure that that happens in in a fair way um the fair principles from the uh, uh, so we need the um, the 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 data spaces and we need the the eu regulation and guidance to ensure that uh, individuals and um, his basic human rights are uh, are maintained in this process, and I'm sure um, it's going to be a, a, a new wave that we have all been waiting to see for some time. Thank you so much, Andre, Christoph, Richard. 
Uh, thank you very much for your contribution. Thanks to the audience for their questions. We raised more questions that we were able to answer and we leave the panel with the feeling we didn't have enough time to, to talk about everything. And at least that's my feeling. Maybe you share that feeling. And if that's what we reached, then exactly that's what we want with a panel to create more points for discussion and more motivation for the topic. Uh, let's discuss during the conference. Thanks to my data for having us. Thanks to everyone listening. And have a great rest of the day and a great conference. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Thanks everyone. a lot. Uh, Goodbye. Bye. Thanks.